A lot has changed since episode 10, or maybe it hasn't. One thing that did change is that the discussion about the rise of the American far right has finally hit peak popularity in mainstream discourse. Ever since Charlottesville, there's been a whole lot of people wondering what can be done about this increased presence of fascists and some people trying to make it not seem like such a big deal. Excuse me. What about the alt-left that came charging at the, as you say, the alt-right? Do they have any semblance of guilt? I want to talk about the long and treacherous road that got us to the point at which Donald Trump asked that question. Of particular note here is his use of the term alt-left. Anyone who paid enough attention to the 2016 election season will remember Hillary Clinton's speech about the basket of deplorables known as the alt-right. The idea of the alternative right was first popularized by Richard Spencer, shown here getting decked in the face on the day of Trump's inauguration. Spencer created the term alt-right to distinguish right-wingers such as himself from establishment neoconservatives, a group which he felt had sold out on conservatism by being too charitable to the idea of globalization. He even called them cuckservatives. The main issue with the idea of an alternative right is that once you look at the beliefs of Spencer and other alt-right ideologues, you start to find out the truth. The alt-right is nothing more than very very thinly veiled fascism. Spencer and his compatriots at the National Policy Institute are fond of propagating the myth that white people are under attack, whether it be due to immigration, multiculturalism, or, of course, the Jews. Spencer himself advocates a white ethnostate, which would be achieved by the peaceful removal of all non-whites from what he believes to be white nations. I hope it won't take much convincing for you to realize that this sort of peaceful ethnic cleansing is not only morally wrong, but it would also be impossible possible to put into practice. In practice, it would amount to little more than genocide. In addition to the whole white nationalism thing, the alt-right also happens to not be so fond of this supposed feminization of society which is happening right now, apparently. People like the Golden One like to harp on this idea of traditional masculinity, which they believe LGBTQ plus people and third wave feminists are undermining by their very existence. A really, really solid fucking podcast. Please do yourself a favor and listen to it. If you're a man, you will get 10 plus in masculinity and a critical chance of resisting feminized behavior. So great talk about masculinity below. Some, like the golden one, will say that they don't really have any problems with these sorts of people so long as they keep their degeneracy to themselves. This desire to repress people trying to live the truth of their lives means that not only is the alt-right fundamentally racist, but also homophobic, transphobic, and misogynistic. So far, the attitudes and values of the alt-right may seem indistinguishable to World War II Germany. However, what separates the alt-right's traditionalism from that of the 1940s is their opposition to political correctness. It's not that this is an idea which is fundamentally new, stand-ups have been ranting about it for decades, but the alt-right's gripes about PC culture are unmistakably millennial. The idea which sucks so many young channers into the alt-right is their supposedly resolute and and unwavering defense of freedom of speech. In abstract, of course, this sounds nice. However, given the way alt-writers treat people they disagree with, often with doxing, threats of violence, and other not-so-nice things, I'd argue it's safe to say that they really just want to preserve their God-given right to be assholes. So, you combine old-school fascist rhetoric about white genocide, anti-Semitism, and anti-feminism with new-school far-right rhetoric about political correctness and a handful of incredibly stale memes, and you've got the alt-right. As I indicated before, I'm not too fond of this term. Richard Spencer seems to have coined it for one of two reasons. Either one, he wanted to position himself as being the leader of a brand new political movement, which the alt-right isn't. Or two, he just lacked the spine to call himself a Nazi. And I'm not just calling him a Nazi because it feels like he is either. He's an out-and-out -out Nazi. In this now infamous speech he gave after Trump's win last November, he quotes Nazi propaganda in the original German with no sense of irony. The main mainstream media, or perhaps we should refer to them in the original German, Lugenpresse. And doesn't seem to stop people from throwing up Hitler salutes and shouting Sig Heil. Of course, that was back in the days when the alt-right was known of, but often mocked and not seen as a serious threat by many. This is perhaps why so many of Hillary Clinton's most vocal supporters, 
many of whom are unfortunately wishy-washy centrist liberal types, popularized the phrase alt-left in the months after Clinton's loss. What you have to understand is that this is a group of people who wanted to blame anybody or anything other than Clinton herself for Trump's victory. These are many of the same people who lashed out at Bernie bros after the primaries and continued to do so well into 2017 and still do as I'm recording this. It's not that Clinton was a candidate with no charisma, no strategy other than coasting to victory on nothing but the merits of have you seen the other guys, and nothing to offer but a milk toast neoliberal policy plan. No, it was the people who wanted single-payer healthcare that were to blame for all this, obviously. Alt-left soon became the rallying cry that these people used to refer to anybody even a little bit left of center, whether that means Bernie Sanders' social democratic supporters, or even tried and true leftists. DSA members, listeners of Chapo Trap House, or even those like myself on the far left left who felt that Sanders' progressive platform still could have gone much, much farther. The problem with using a term like alt-left in this case is obvious. The alt-right is a fascist movement. The end goal of its ideology is genocide. The supposed alt-left is mostly made up of people who want the exact opposite of this. Whether it's a future to believe in or well-being for all, there's no equivalence there. None. Then there was a very small trend that never really took in the skeptic community of people trying to reclaim alt-left as a skeptic thing. Uh, it didn't really happen and nobody really took notice. As we've covered on this show previously, the right loves to co-opt terms from the rest of the political spectrum and repurpose them for their own devices. This is what happened to the term alt-left when Antifa started receiving unprecedented media coverage. After Charlottesville, people on the right, not necessarily the alt-right, saw these masked militant protesters fighting Nazis head-on and somehow didn't see the Nazis as the real problem. Never mind the fact that the organizers of Unite the Right told people to come armed. Never mind the fact that a counter-protester literally fucking died at the hands of a Nazi driving a car into a crowded street. It was the commies that started it. Because direct action scares people, Antifa drew criticism from right-wingers as being part of an alt-left which was equal in terms of severity to the alt-right. And the central Interests fell for it again, hook, line, and sinker. Horseshoe theory's funny that way. As with the use of this term previously by centrists, there's still no comparison. A movement whose end goal is genocide is inviting a violent response by the very nature of its existence. Nazis must be stopped at all costs, and sometimes militancy is the only way that's possible. If Nazism could have been debated or talked out of existence, it would have fizzled away in 1920. Can't believe I live in a time where people will side with Nazis over people who are explicitly anti-Nazi. This reframing of what constitutes the alt-left led to a whole lot of equivalent even from the President of the United States. At first, he refused to even condemn the far right by name, saying there was violence on many sides. Some time later, and only under intense pressure, let me remind you, he eventually said white nationalists are bad, but then he corncobbed some more in front of the entire press. What about the alt-left that came charging at the, as you say, the alt-right? Do they have any semblance of guilt? Do they have any problem? I think they do. Wait a minute. I'm not finished. I'm not finished, fake news. After our very own white nationalist in chief got his hands on the idea of an alt-left, the Clinton Brigade changed their tune. Many of them now proudly identified as alt-left as a rebuke of everything Trump embodies. If you're asking me, I think we just need to drop this whole alt-politics thing in general. If the alt-right came about because of a pretentious Nazi, the alt-left came about as the result of a bunch of sore losers trying to shift the blame on anyone other than the racehorse they lost all their money betting on. The these are some pathetic origin stories. The alt-right is merely white nationalism for the modern era, something which most of us realize by now. The alt-left is somehow even more pathetic than the pawn scum that is fascism. What is truly pitiful about the alt-left is that it's a fiction. It doesn't even get the dignity to have thought leaders or think tanks or websites. The idea that it could possibly exist merely serves as a distraction. Our enemy is fascism. May no amount of equivocation ever distract us from this simple truth.